we're, we're in this new series that we're starting today called Greater Works, Greater Expectations. Greater Works, Greater Expectations. Um, and the idea is that Jesus makes this promise uh, that, that we're under in the New Testament that we're going to do, and, and you see it in John 14, we're going to do the same works that he did, and then he one-ups it. He said, but no, you're going to do greater works than I did. And um, what, we're, what we're seeing here is that we have this promise of greater works. And the only thing that accentuates that, the only thing that actually goes along with that, our only proper response to that is that we would have greater expectations. That we would actually grow in what we expect God to, to be and do. And so that's what this series is all about. How is it that we can grow in, our, in, in greater expectations of who God is and what he wants to do under the promise of him doing these greater works uh, in our midst? Today, we are in the midst of a 21-day uh, uh, fast and prayer. And we were doing it with uh, four other local churches. And it was great. Friday night, we had a great night of worship. If you, there's two more Friday night worships. Um, if, if you didn't get to make the last one, I highly encourage you to make one of the upcoming Friday nights. Um, I will not, unfortunately, be able to be there. It's weird to, like, say, push something and then I'm not there. I just I have two other commitments that I can't be there. But I was at the first one, and I, and I need to tell you, there was, like, the Spirit of God upon us in a just crazy, rich way, overwhelming overwhelming what God was doing there. So you've got to be a part of it. I mean, when the church comes together and unified, making much of the name of Jesus, it's really cool what happens. You don't want to miss the next two. Friday night, 7 o'clock at Coastal Chapel. Um, but the prayer focus for today, it's 21 days of prayer. Each uh, day that we've been sending out, um, if, if you're not a part of it, you can go to uh, United 21 21- daydayfast.com, and you can get linked in. You'll get a, a daily update of what we're praying for this particular day. This particular day, we're praying for church gatherings. We're praying for church gatherings that God would do something, like, radically special in this moment. So I don't know what you brought in here. I don't know what, what's going on, what you're carrying, what your marriage looks like. I don't know how, how it's been for you this last sort of season, even this last week. Um, but I, I just want to do my best, like, Now's the time. Let's raise our expectation. Let's raise our expectation that we're not just in attendance, but that God wants to do something in our midst. Let's, let's, let's pray that in, and then, uh, and then we'll get started. Father, thank you that you are a God who is still on the move. You love to move. You love to be uh, working in your people. God, you are the way maker. You're the promise keeper. And so, Father, I pray today that you would fill this space, this room with your Holy Spirit. I pray that it would be just rich upon us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. And I pray that you would, uh, maybe for the first time, bring somebody to life as your Holy Spirit just invades their hearts and minds today. So, Father, we pray that you would be doing this throughout the five churches that are a part of this fast. We pray that you would be doing this throughout this region here in South Florida. Lord, in your world, would your kingdom come in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, greater works, greater expectations. I just want to take a second, uh, talk to you a little bit about that. Um, John 14 is what has been guiding our last year and will continue to guide our year. And in John 14, like I said, Jesus says you're going to, he's talking to his disciples, but we're able to, we're able to see the application um, to us as well. So whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So there's the promise of the Holy Spirit that we're going to do greater works than Jesus. What does that mean? Well, I haven't walked on water. Um, I haven't fed 5,000. My family, fee- it seems like that sometimes with my 14-year-old. But, I, but I, like, it, like I haven't done, so greater works, what, what does this mean? Well, what's the greatest work that Jesus did? His death and his resurrection. His, assur- his, his giving us salvation. His ushering us into the kingdom. So, so salvation is like the great work of the king, that he would come and work salvation in our midst. And so if we're going to do greater works, We're believing that means that's evangelism. That's not just um, Jesus and his 12 beginning to invite people into the kingdom of God. It's a whole army called his church 
on mission, where they live, where they work, where they play, with the gospel message so deeply in their heart that it overflows and it invites other people into it. And we're believing that we're going to see greater works. We're going to see like more people come into the kingdom than even Jesus saw in his three-year ministry because he's released the strategy of the church filled with his Holy Spirit to share the gospel and see people get saved. It's how you got here, okay? You're actually a part of the greater works, and now you're commissioned to do the greater works. And so if, if, if that's true, then, then what we've done is we're just believing that it's going to be true in our time, that we're actually going to see some of these greater works in our time. And, and so we've been, um, we've been walking through a vision for two years. It's called Vision 2020. Um, and, and the idea with Vision 2020 is that we would like to see the identified number of born-again Christians in our area go from 3% to 6%. So that number should just sit with you for a second, that there's 3% of people who are identified as Christians. In, and I forget if this was fl- all Florida, but I, I wanna, I'm not sure if it was just South Florida or in our, in our area. But, but 3%. Came out as, and there was, there was qualifying questions that, you know, do you believe this, and what about that, and all those sort of things. 3%. And, and so uh, we're a church that's a part of a movement called Church United, which is churches coming together uh, for the glory of Jesus, and that we're, we're unified but, but on mission because we believe we're better together, according to what John 17 says. We're actually more evangelistic together. Uh, because as we come together, then the world will see. And so the larger vision for, for Church United is that they would see this by the year 2023. And what we did is like, that's awesome. We just want to do our part over the next two years. I I was like so excited about what's happening. I'm like, let's make this a two-year vision for us. And so we're like, hey, let's let's see in our area, let's see the the needle move from 3% to 6%. And so what we did is we just looked at, uh, as you heard baptisms, we looked at, well, how many people have we baptized? And, And we looked at that for like two years ago, and we did the math, and we said for us, it seems like for us to see in our area, in, our, in what, we're, what God's given us to, to shepherd, we, we would be looking at 200 baptisms over the next two years for us to see the number double. That would be doubling about the amount of baptisms that we see. And so we're, we're into year two of, of this vision. And um, Mitch, are you here? Mitch, yeah, there he is. <laughs> That's like a redundant question, isn't it? Mitch, are you here? Mitch, did, did, did we ever get a final number on baptisms for year one of this vision? Close to 90. Okay, so first of all, can we just give God a hand for 90 people getting baptized? That's awesome. So, so that, that's where this is coming from. We're just, we're just believing God that, man, like, hey, let's, let's keep Let's keep our expect- expectations high. Let's believe that God wants to see these greater works in our time. And now what can we do in order to join him in this? We don't save people, but certainly we join God in his saving efforts. So for us, what we've said is, well, it would take a different culture. And we're going to look at four things throughout this year that are a part of that culture. Expectation, hospitality, empowerment, and invitation. And that's what this series is all about, greater expectations. Because if you look at the scriptures, you're going to see that there's like, um, there's, there's usually, not always, it's not like, it's not like 100%, but, but usually there is, there's a degree, even if it's a mustard seed degree of faith, that goes along with where God is working. You remember when Jesus left that city? Because he's like, what's going on here? There, wh- where's the faith? If, if, he were to, if he were to look at... Um, a, a, an interaction that he has with his disciples that might be on a somewhat regular basis, he's, what is he always inviting them into? Oh, ye of little faith. Okay, so I'm not really sure that's condemning. I don't know. Like, I didn't hear the tone in which Jesus gave it. But, but I, I think it's invitational. It's like, believe me, man. I'm Jesus. I just got back in the boat out of the water. I just fed the 5,000. You just saw that. It's like, believe what we just sang. And so that's what this is, is how are we to grow in our expectation of God to be who God says he is and do what he wants to do? How can we grow in that? Because we see the pattern in Scripture where, where, there's, where there's like a growing expectation, where there's faith, where we're seeing, we're seeing God do really awesome things. Now, a caveat. 
This is not that we manipulate God. This is not like a prosperity gospel where it's like, well, if I just believed, then God would have acted. No, 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 that's not what this is. So I love how John Piper deals with this. He, he says something, I'm not gonna, it's not a quote, so just this is Casey's version of John Piper. And John Piper's like a really smart, awesome pastor, and I'm me. So, so there you go. Um, basically, here's what he says. He's like, in God's sovereignty, in his control, under his power, he's somehow ordained that the prayers of his people change things. They affect things. And I think he, he cites Rome, uh, James 4.2. Uh, and so he's saying, it doesn't compromise God's sovereignty. And it's not like, oh man, well, if I would have just had more faith, this would have happened, or this person would have gotten better, or I would have had that. No, no, no. That's not, that's not the, the lane we're traveling in. The lane we're traveling in is the lane that Jesus invites us into, where he's like, believe on me. Like, don't show up to stuff. Don't continue to show up to the rest of your life and think that just your attendance is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to show up and actually expect me to be there and do something. So let's lean into, God, what is it that you want to do in this moment? What is it that you want to do in my family? And how can I join you by faith in that? Not assuming, not presuming my agenda or my timing or my will, but with this great wide-eyed expectation, like I know you're going to do something. I'm believing that you want to do more than is the reality right now because you always make things better, God. So here I am, believing and walking in that. Will you, will you walk with me for the next few weeks in that? Would that be okay? Cool. Well, we're going to look at a few people who had that type of um, expectation. And, and they saw God do some pretty cool things. And, and by the end of, of this series, hopefully, we will have established some traits of people who, who live like this, who, who have these greater expectations of God. And so we're going to do a deep dive in, in six sort of areas of, of the scripture, and we're going to be looking at one trait per Sunday. Today we're looking at confidence. Confidence. How many of you feel like you are a confident person? Confident. Okay, couple, couple cool. So like in church, you're kind of like, I don't know if I should raise my hand right now. Because like, does that compromise my humility, and then I'm going to get judged, and why like, like you it's okay, it's okay. We're, that's what we're here to do. We're actually here to grow in confidence. We, we are here to grow in confidence. The idea here, though, is what, is what does confidence look like? Because the world sort of has, has a perception of confidence. They have an offering of confidence, and the scriptures have an offering of confidence, and they're different. In the world, it's probably easy to see um, confident people and, and, and sort of confident organizations, and I'm not going to name them because we just end up going down the road of becoming, like, super judgy, and I don't want to do that, right? Like, we don't want to, I don't want to lead you into that. But you can, you can just picture, like, what, what the world would say confidence is, and it's, it's a really high degree of belief in self, and, like, I got this. And, you know, like, nobody talks to me like that, can't hold me down, whatever the case may be. Guarantees, like, big kind of smack talk. That, that's the world's, like, idea of, of confidence. But the scriptures have a different idea of confidence. And, I, and I, might, I might say it goes like this. If the world's view of confidence is, I've got this, the scripture's view of confidence is, we've got this. We've got this. Now, who's the we've? Well, Jesus and me. Now, sometimes you're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm cool to say, like, Jesus has this, but, like, you, you end up separating yourself way over here. I think that would be a mistake. I think that would be a mistake because as you look at the New Testament, there's a few promises made, and one of those promises is really key to confidence. And, and here's the promise. It's that when you become a believer in Christ, when you trust that his death on the cross is enough for your forgiveness— adoption into the family, and you turn from your sin and yourself, and you turn from trying to find life outside of God, and you're like, Jesus, you're it, man. I get it. You died for me. I should have died. I mean, I, I want everything you have for me. And you come to him in that humble, hands-open type faith. Here's a few promises. You get forgiven of all your sin. 
You're, you're, you, you begin to live a new life. You're adopted into a new family. You now are made right with God forever. But listen, don't miss this promise. Jesus now comes to live inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And so it's Jesus in me and, and me in Jesus. And so there's this great union that Jesus um, enters into with you where he now lives inside of you and is working these greater works both in you and through you. And so it's very theologically appropriate and necessary for you to start to think, we've got this. We've got this. Because it's not like you're going to sit passive while he destroys your anxiety. It's not like you're going to just hang out while he takes care of all your addictive behaviors. It's not like you're just going to be like, oh, that's cool, Jesus, let me know when my marriage is awesome. <laughs> Jesus, take care of those kids. Whoa, that would be super helpful for me. I'm fasting from parenting. I'm trusting you. You got it. You got it. <laughs> hey. That, that's, not how, that's not how it works. Oh, oh your, marriage is, your marriage isn't where you want it to be? Okay. We've got this. We've got this. Your kids, you need to go chase one. You need to go get one. You need to go pursue this. You've been struggling with it. Okay, okay, okay. We've got this. And that's the kind of confidence uh, that David had. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you have your Bibles, uh, today is all about Psalm 27. And we're just going to work our way through uh, Psalm 27 in, uh, in the hopes that God will indeed grow our confidence. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil, evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Confident. So it, it appears that David is a man of confidence. I don't know if you know much about David. We, we did a, a brief little look at him last week where um, he's the guy who fights Goliath, right? And he's the guy who slays the giant. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the commentators that I was reading s says that there, there may be a reference uh, when it comes to like the eating of the flesh because that's one of the things that, that Goliath told David was like send, send the person out because I'm going to basically, you know, give his flesh to the birds or something like that. And so, so we, we may know that David is this guy who, who fought this giant and, you know, like overcame some stuff. And the way he's talking right now, I mean, this is pretty confident talk about a guy not who is removed from his enemies, but who knows what it is to say, like, we've got this as he faces his enemies. This is not running, David. This is standing firm and moving forward, David, in the midst of adversity. We've got this. We've got this. So my question is, well, well how does he get this type of confidence? I mean, because you might be thinking, yeah, but he's in the Bible. I mean, have you ever thought that about, if you read some, a passage, you're like, yeah, but like, you can just kind of dismiss it. Because, like, well, that's either, like, in Bible times, or that's a Bible character, or, like, that's Jesus. So, like, you kind of take a pass on that one. But remember, Jesus lives in you if you are a believer in Christ. And so there's no passes for us to take. We have expectation of these greater works. And so, yeah, but he's in the Bible, but yeah, but Jesus lives in you. So these things are actually possible. This type of confidence well, it can be yours. It can be mine. And what we're going to do today is look through, well, how did David seem to, like, grow in this? Or, or what were some of the things that accompanied this type of confidence? Continue reading with me. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. 
and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me. Answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face do I seek. So the first thing and the main thing that David does is, is he, he becomes a, a one-thing guy. And we talked about this last week. One thing. One thing. It was seeking after the presence or the person of God. And so if, if you're looking to grow in confidence, if you're kind of um, tired of the like couple steps here, a couple steps out, I'm not talking about sanctification. I, I, know, sanctifi- I, know, I know becoming like Jesus is, is like a, a lifelong process. I'm talking about the belief that it's actually going to happen. If you're tired of kind of like, like living in, in this doubt and I don't know and confusion, well, one of the things, the main thing that you need to do is seek the presence of God. David said he was a one thing God. It's the one thing I want. I want to I get after God. I want to get after God because things change in the presence of God. Did you know that? Things actually shift in the presence of God. There's a song that I love to sing in, in, in private worship, and it goes, um, something always changes when I bless your name. And, and the idea of the song is that when, when, I, when I come into the presence of God, like, like things start to get shifted. Things start to change. Like, like it's a real shift. It's a real presence. He's a real way maker. And, and so the first sort of step if you will, to growing in confidence, growing in greater expectation, is becoming a one-thing person. Like getting after God's presence as though it were life and death. I guess I would ask you the question, like, is it life, life and death to you guys? Like the presence of God and making sure that you're pursuing it and abiding in Christ. I'm not just talking about a morning devotion or, or reading your script. That's important. That is radically important that you have time set aside to be with God. And I don't know how you can, be, I don't, the confidence that you would garner outside of that would probably be worldly confidence if you're not having that. If you're confident and you're not spending like regular quality time in God's presence, it's probably a false confidence is all I have to say. Because I'm not sure how you would do that. What I'm talking about is moment by moment like seeking the presence of God, like right now. Not when you read your Devo this morning or, or not later or not tomorrow morning. I'm talking about right now where like the name of Jesus is on your lips and the love of Jesus is in your mind and the activity of Jesus is in your hands. You want to start living in confidence? You've got to bring that into your life like all the time, all the time inviting God's Holy Spirit to fill you, to remind you of his truth, to be speaking his promises over the things that crop up in the midst of your situations. When your anger crops up, you know what you need to do? You don't need to white knuckle it. You don't, you don't, you don't need to, to run away from the situation, although I understand if, if you're getting hot, yeah, take a little break, I get that. I know there's practical stuff. You, you need the presence of God. Well, God's everywhere. I know he's everywhere. But remember what we did last week with Travis? If you weren't here, watch the video. It was like, God is everywhere. But when you call him forward and you ask your father in a specific way to come fill you, be with you, and help you, he he loves to do that. Everything shifts in his presence. So if you're thinking that you're not really a person of confidence and you don't look at God like David looked at God, I would ask you how important is God's presence in your life? His regular moment by moment, like I'm going home, so I say, Holy Spirit, fill me. I'm, I'm entering my house. I'm going into a meeting, and I'm in the meeting, and all of a sudden, I'm like out of words. I don't know what to do, or anxiety comes up. Like, Jesus. Just whispering his name because you're believing there's power in his name. And then later you're sitting with friends and you're having coffee and it's just great time. There's nothing wrong in the world and you just, you just offer a brief prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. This is awesome. You get the best parking spot on Trinity's campus. <laughs> Jesus, what? Am I your favorite? <laughs> Come on. 
you get the worst parking spot in torrential rain. Jesus, thank you you're coming back. Thank you that you're going to make all things right. I'm going to be dry and warm and just worshiping you. It's going to be awesome. New body, not going to be shivering. Constantly seeking his presence. That is the main ingredient to confidence. And what we're going to look at here are the things that you could make the case flow out of that. Work with that. The things that were a part of David's life that were attached to this. And we can lean into those as well. The second one is vulnerability. Vulnerability. Read with me. Don't read with me. Just read it, and I'll read it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm going to talk. You just follow along. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Vulnerability. Do you, do you guys sense the like... Um, the desperation in David's voice there. He's like, so he starts off confident, right? Remember the first couple of verses? He's like, what? You got an army? We've got this. You know, maybe he's got his sling that he used to use right back there. He like rubs it a little bit. I don't know what he, but he's like super confident. In the first, and then all of a sudden he's like, God, you, bro, you cannot leave me. Like, don't hide your face from me. I mean, I mean, it, like, you can't, there's no way I can. Isn't it crazy how in the same psalm, you've got David who's like, what? And then David who's like, oh my goodness, God, you can't, you, be, you better, man. Like, I mean, it, it kind of seems like my Thursday. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what your Thursday looked like or, or your Friday or your whatever, but is it not true that one moment you're like, what? And the next moment, you're like, ah, oh, wow, what did he say about God's prayer? Oh, my goodness, Jesus, gee, where are you? Heaven? Well, cool. You can still walk in confidence if that's you, because look at our boy David. He's like, yes. And then he's like, God, you can't. As a matter of fact, I would propose that the vulnerability of David in this passage, as he talks to God, and even as he says this thing about his father and mother, it actually can accentuate the presence of God when you invite God into your vulnerability. The problem is when we get vulnerable at times, we don't let God in. We don't even let other people in. We might not even understand vulnerability, or if we do, we like vulnerability on our own. But here's what God is saying. Vulnerability is best expressed in community and when he gets invited in. Vulnerability. If you're lacking in confidence, then maybe vulnerability is lacking as well. Let's take a next, look at the next one, changeability. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. You know, one of the things that, that David did was he had, the, he had the ability to change. You know how, like how we change? I want to remind you. We've got this. We've got this. You're not going to change yourself. Come on. Look at us. I've been trying 45 years. I'm still stuck in some of the same cul-de-sacs. Why? Because I try to usually, probably, because I try to, I'm, I'm all for change, but I usually try to say, like, I've got this. But when I get vulnerable, and I realize, oh, I think I've been pursuing my own self-saving efforts here, and I bring that before the Lord, and I ask God to teach me his way. I ask God to show me because my enemies are too strong. Well, then I see change, and so do you. And when you see change, you know what you see? Confidence. You actually sing songs like that because you know you're not the person you were because God's been changing you. So if your confidence is lacking, man, I would, I would say examine your changeability. 
Are you walking in, in, the, in the way that God has called you to walk? At our, at our gathering this Friday night, I felt like the Lord just spoke to me, pressed on my heart. Like, man, um, you're looking for healing and you're looking for deliverance. I've done those things for you. I'm continuing to do them, but, but you need to now walk in them. Like, walk in the healing I've given you. Walk in the deliverance from your anxiousness that I've given you. You know what would be really weird is if Lazarus stayed in the tomb. Lazarus was this dead guy, if you don't know, that Jesus, he, he brought back to life. And then he was like, Lazarus, come on out. Wouldn't that be really weird if Lazarus was like, nah. <laughs> I'm good. You know what would happen? People would have probably come and fed Lazarus. They would have given him new clothes. They would have talked to him. They would have encouraged him. But he would have spent the rest of his life in his tomb. When you know Jesus invited him out. You want confidence? Start walking even though it feels like death at the beginning in the freedom that he's given you and believe that what you need to take that next step will be there and you'll become more and more a person of confidence the last stop today is patience I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living wait for the Lord be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Somebody told me, I forget where they heard it or got it this week as we were talking about this particular point, that trust can oftentimes be actualized in the waiting. Trust, greater expectations, faith, it can, it can come to life in the waiting, not just when it's all over and, and wrapped up. Like, God does crazy awesome stuff while we wait. The problem is we don't get what we want when we want it. We are not a society that is famous for waiting. So when we hear David encourage us, wait for the Lord. Let your heart be strong. Where should the heart be strong? When it's all done, when everything got wrapped up, when you got the provision, when your marriage is awesome, when the anxiety is going away, when are you supposed to be strong? When you're waiting. When you're waiting, wait for the Lord. Let your heart be strong. Take courage, wait for the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, my life verse. Why? Because it speaks life into me when everything inside of me is telling me that I've waited too long and now I need to do something on my own. No, you don't. You keep waiting. You keep believing and you keep walking and allow him in his timing and in his goodness to give you what your heart desires for his glory and these greater works. Now, as we move into the communion moment, this is a moment for us that, that, that we get to wait upon the Lord, that we get to trust in the Lord, that we get to not hurry, and, and we, get to, we get to just kind of soak in his presence and allow this, this meal, if you will, this spiritual meal to, to encourage us and give us sustenance. I wanted to ask a question before we get there. It's hugely important to where we are as a church. And here's the question. So where would be the best place to experience these things? God's presence, vulnerability, changeability, and patience. Where at the avenue would be the best place to experience these? Richard, if you could go to that slide that's got them all listed there, please. Keep going. One more, please. Thank you. Awesome. God's presence, vulnerability, changeability, and patience. Where at the avenue 
is the best place for you to grow in your confidence and experience all these things. It is not Sunday morning. Trust me. It is not by hearing another 40 some odd minute message from me. That is not where you're going to grow in your confidence primarily. It might help, it might kickstart something here or there. Where at the avenue are you going to do this? It's not Sunday morning, it's not on your own, it's in community at the Avenue Church. It's in small groups at the Avenue Church, which is where God's presence, our vulnerability, changeability, and patience happens best. It's in the family of gathered men and women of the Avenue Church outside of Sunday morning. Yes, this is huge. Yes, this is important. Yes, God's presence is here and doing things. But if you want to experience this at the next level, you've got to find yourself in one of these groups. It's like a must. So the night before Jesus was betrayed, he was in community as well. And he said to his community, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember me by doing these things. And the church has done these things for thousands of years. It's called the Lord's Supper or communion. And in that night, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is going to remind you of how my body is going to be broken for you. And he took the cup and he poured it out, which we have here filled with little juice cups. And he said, this is going to remind you of how my blood is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And what was really cool is the first Lord's Supper was done in community, which is why we do it in community continually. It's the pattern that Jesus set. We love this in community because we're believing that God's presence as we partake will do stuff to us. He will encourage us. He will nourish us spiritually. He will speak to us. He will convict us. One of the things it says here is that before you take, uh, uh, examine yourself. What that means is the way we take it, uh, make sure you're a Christian and you've come to that place where it's Christ and Christ alone as your salvation. You've turned from self and sin and, and you're trusting in him. And the second thing we believe that to mean is that you've examined yourself and you're not making peace with sin anywhere. Like you're not okay with, you know, financial sin that you might be in, overspending. You're not okay with sexual sin. You're, 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 you're not okay with the impurities that might be online that you're partaking in. You're, you're, you're not okay with, with cohabitating. You're, you're not okay with sex before marriage. You're, you're, not, you're not okay with these things because they're outside of the pattern of God's, of God's call on your life and it means you're fighting against them. You might not be perfect, but you're fighting against them. If you find yourself okay with them, then what the New Testament tells us is that this, this, let, like, this is not for you right now. Right now, just do business with God and ask God to soften your heart where you've become hard. Ask God to wake you up where you've slumbered. And then next time come. And so I would invite us as we, we're going to sing a song that will be sung over you. You can look at the words and, and listen and, and be encouraged by them. But I would encourage you, if you are a believer and you are desperately needy and vulnerable like David was for Jesus in both your good days and your bad, then we would love to invite all imperfect and needy people to come and receive communion now. I'll come back up and, and I'll close this uh, uh, together so you can partake when you're ready. And so the Apostle Paul also tells us that this is a looking forward to his coming back. We look back to what he's accomplished and we look forward to what he promises to accomplish in the renewal of all things as he calls people to himself through faith and repentance. So take the bread, take, eat. This is the body of Christ in remembrance of. And this is the cup in, remem in remembrance of the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink.
that we believe these things to be symbolic of his body and of his blood. But we believe that there is a real spiritual nourishment that happens when we partake as his body, looking back to what he's accomplished and forward to what he promises. May the taking of his supper, preaching of his word, the singing of his greatness and the fellowship of these believers may be a great encouragement to you as you grow in confidence in Christ. Father, we ask that you would take these moments and you would multiply them far beyond what we can even see now. Father, we come into your presence and we believe that in your presence you will lift our heads high above our enemies and that we might, together with you, be able to accomplish these greater works that you promise. Fill us with your spirit for these things to your glory and our good. And all of God's people said, amen.